Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here in person on this beautiful day. If you'd be so kind as to silence your cell phones at this time, we'd be most appreciative. My name is Isabella with the Engagement Programs team, and I'm thrilled to have you all joining us to celebrate Bridget Riley drawings from the artist studio. The first and most extensive museum exhibition dedicated exclusively to Riley's drawings in over half a century. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from J.A. Clark. Jay is the Rothman Family Curator of Prints and Drawings here at the Art Institute of Chicago. From 2009 to 2018, she was the Manton Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Clark Institute, as well as a lecturer in the Graduate Program in the History of Art at Williams College. Jay has written several articles on Cat Cowlitz, Edward Monk, and the materials, processes, and markets of prints and drawings circa 1900. She received her master's and PhD from Brown University, and now I'd like to welcome Jay to the stage. Thank you, Izzy, for that lovely introduction. It's great to see you all here today. I'm so happy this isn't a Zoom talk. <laughs> that way, yay. That way, if I catch any of you sleeping, I can start talking really loud. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it has been such an honor and a privilege uh, to work on this exhibition, to work with a real living legend, uh, Bridget Riley to shape, um, along with her and my other two curators, a narrative about her life's work. All of the works, except one in this exhibition, which belongs to the Art Institute of Chicago's permanent collection, are from the artist's studio. So these are works she's kept back her entire career, um, and therefore they're works that have a lot of meaning to her personally. So uh, I'm, gonna, not, I'm not gonna go on and on. I'm gonna speak for about 45 minutes and I hope to leave lots of times for question afterwards. So just to give an example of how long many of these works have been in her studio, um, we see a photograph of uh, the artist on the right and then behind her head in a sort of halo-like fashion, one could say, is this drawing called Blaze from 1962, um, which is one of the works in the exhibition. So today we're first gonna focus on the early years of her drawing practice when she was a student in London and the struggles she encountered at art school and how she came to abstraction. Artists don't just come out of the womb painting abstract art. Um, they often have um, a lot of years of study and practice doing works of art that are highly detailed. Um, and some of these early works I think you might find surprising and very instructive. So I see one of these, uh, I'll show you one of these early works of fabulous self-portrait on the left from 1956. Then we're gonna move on to look at her black and white works, which are sort of seen as her breakthrough moment. Uh, in the middle, this one is Study for Shuttle. Then we're gonna go on to look at some of these crossover works, which we see on the far right. <clears throat> and um, we'll then address uh, the meaning behind many of the curved and the striped works, um, for which the artist is probably most famous before we turn to her most um, recent works of sort of diagonals, diagonal work, which we'll talk about later. And my hope is that this overview of her career in drawing will help us to grasp the importance of the medium for her, as well as to guide those who are maybe less familiar with her work. Um, and some of the abstract work can be a little bit hard to grasp at first. It certainly was for me. And one of the things that's very important about this artist, and I'd say any artist, <clears throat> excuse me, is to take time to stand in front of the work and really study it. Hers is not the kind of work you can just pass by. I mean, sure you can if you want to, but the longer you stand in front of it, I really think the more you get out of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I learned, I have to say, I learned a lot in the process of installing the exhibition over the last two weeks as I saw um, the work sort of come to life in different ways. And one thing I did want to point out is these drawings are really the last moment of her creative process. So what the artist would do is she would make a number of different studies um, 
of these drawings. And then once she sort of finished and said she was done with her composition, she would hand these drawings over to studio assistants who would execute her final painting. So these drawings are really, this is when she's done with her creative process and then she hands it over, which I think is, was unusual in the 1960s, not so unusual now, certainly a practice um, active in the Renaissance period. Um, but it's kind of interesting to think of these as um, her, her studies for later paintings. Um, and ironically, as I stand here showing you digital images, one after the other, um, it's very hard to grasp her work via uh, any kind of reproduction. You get a sense of the work, but not the optical play that is work. Um, and one example that I wanted to tell, tell a tale on myself, the one on the left, red, green, and blue twisted curves, um, when I had first seen this, I saw horizontal curves, like waves going across the sheet of paper. And I was working on this top. My colleague, um, Jamie, helped me with some of my PowerPoints. And what she saw, if you look from, she saw zigzags going vertically up and down. I don't know if you can see those, sort of triangular. And then for a while, that's all I could see. And so sometimes the works like literally switch back and forth, you know, that old, um, adage of it is, it, is it a duck or is it a rabbit? You know, sometimes things can really um, switch back and forth, which is kind of exciting. One important work um, in this effect is her painting called Cataract Three. She painted um, repeated patterns of vermilion and turquoise stripes, and they move, again, they sort of move across the canvas like waves. And the blue and the red color contrast the play with the viewer's vision, and they make the entire canvas seem to breathe and move. And when I was trying to find a, a JPEG of this image for the PowerPoint, I came up with about five different versions. And I was like, wait a minute, but which one is Cataract 3? They were all Cataract 3. But you can't really catch it. You can't catch a precise image because every camera, every eye, interprets the work a little bit differently. So our exhibition here at the Art Institute is the first display of her drawings in the United States since 1966. Um, that exhibition was organized by the Museum of Modern Art as a traveling exhibition. It actually wasn't on view at the Museum of Modern Art. It was specifically organized as a traveling exhibition. Um, it traveled to 10 different venues across the United States, mostly art or technical schools. One of the stops was our very own IIT, the Illinois Institute of Technology. So clearly the artist was interested in traveling her works um, for their educational potential specifically, as she very much is to this day. Um, she supports visits to the British Museum for art students so they can look at Renaissance and 18th and 19th century drawings and study from them. So she herself is very, her foundation really supports um, the act of looking and introducing students to different kinds of works. Oh, and just to show you um, on the two images on the right are, is a brochure from the exhibition that was created. And I'm happy to say that each and every work in the brochure is in our exhibition. So that's how long and how carefully she's kept all of these. Many of these drawings have been shown very few times, some of them never before. She just kept them all along. And I'll point out some of the ones that have never been shown before. But they reveal to us a great deal, I think, because at that moment, all she was doing was drawing. Um, in her early years, she was intimidated by color. She was intimidated by paint. She wasn't ready to go there, shall we say. And so what she did is she focused on drawing for over two years, and that's all she did. So the linear tonal and color works that she created throughout the 1950s, they very much show her way of seeing. And that's one of the things we're going to do as we look at her early works is show maybe a little bit of what what could have come after, what we see in her early figurative works that we can also see in works that she's making to this day. And I must add, she's 91 years old and still working in her studio every day. So her, I show her one of her early drawings here on the left when she was at um, Cheltenham Ladies College in 1946. And we can see she did rather conventional drawings, very photographically accurate. As I said, she didn't come out of the womb making stripes. Um, and this drawing, I, it's actually, this is not in the exhibition, but I think it's a great place to start because self-portraiture is always so wonderfully revealing. And what we see here is on the left side of the screen that we see, 
we see she has a, a, a line in graphite and then shading below her chin to show the dark areas. And then as we go over to the right side, it's almost her cheek is almost completely blank. This is where the light is falling. And um, it's really just the sheet of the paper. So there are no marks there until we get to her ear. We see this tiny slip of an ear with shading underneath it. But she uses the sheet of the paper very much as a color. Um, and we're going to see that um, again and again. And on the right, we see a portrait of her mother, another figure drawing. And one of the things that I love about this is not how beautifully her mother's face is rendered, but how there's these tiny little doodles on the bottom, which we all do, just tiny little cartoon figures wailing away time. Maybe she never thought this would be on the walls of the Art Institute of Chicago, but I think sometimes those little doodles are just as revealing as the finished work. Um, so what I'm going to do, one of the things I did in the exhibition, which you will see, is every panel in a separate section of the exhibition has a quote by the artist. And I really wanted her voice to be present. Um, I wanted people to sort of see the work through her eyes, as it were, through her own writing. And I did this as well in the talk. I interspersed it with a couple of um, YouTube videos. So here's, here's the first one. And this is about, specifically about her drawing practice. Could you say something about maybe the importance of drawing and technique for you as the basis for your work? Yes. Before I started to draw, though, I have started to look. I actually didn't think about being an artist at all. Well, I didn't think about art either. I thought to find a context in which somehow I could exercise something in me, which I didn't know what it was, but it was about looking. Where to do that, it just seemed that the only place I could go was to an art school. So what she's really saying here is she didn't even know she was going to be an artist, but she knew whatever it was she was going to do, it was going to require looking. And I'm going to read you um, another quote by the artist, which is specifically about drawing. She wrote this as an essay in 2009. For me, drawing is an inquiry, a way of finding out. The first thing that I discover is that I do not know. It's as though there's an eye at the end of my pencil, which tries, independently of my personal general purpose eye, to penetrate a kind of obscure, obscuring veil or thickness. While drawing, I am watching and simultaneously recording myself looking, discovering things that on the one hand are staring me in the face, and yet on the other, I have rarely seen. So again, this notion of, of, of looking and recording, but not necessarily um, understanding what's going to go on the page until, until it's there. And it, I show you two drawings here from a little bit after 1949, where at the age of 18, Riley began her formal training at Goldsmiths College in London. She was frustrated, um, again, and unsure where to begin. So she felt, as I mentioned before, she felt that painting was out of reach. So she decided to, as she said, begin at the beginning with drawing. And she focused solely on drawing, as I said, for over two years, working very carefully with her tutor at the time, whose name was Sam Rabin. She drew from the live model, as we can see here. And Rabin very much urged her to embody visual experience, to learn to look and not just transcribe what was seen. And one of the things the artist says a lot is what, what Rabin would instruct her to do was say, OK, you're drawing the, fi the figure sitting. Does it look like it's sitting? Is it a sitting drawing? So really just embodying the experience. And two things I want to show you here are um, her careful attention to the structure of the body. Um, this is a detail of this figure right side up, and this here is a detail of this face. And what she does is she does, uh, draws a line right through, which is called a plumb line. So she's trying to figure out what is the center point of the figure here on the page. And here, what you see is a line here, a line here, and a line here, all going in different directions, figuring out where the sh which direction the shoulders are going in, when they go in that direction, then the hips go in this direction, and the feet go. So she's really lining up, um, lining up the form in a very careful way. A little bit after this, she started using Conti crayon um, for tone specifically for the sort of black, white, and gray tonality. Conti crayon is made out of a carbon black pigment and a binder. 
And you can create both fine lines with it, as we see um, around the figure, the very fine, um, precise lines that she draws as a sort of marking around the figure. And then she could turn the instrument on its sides for the very broad strokes, which we see in the background. So one of the things I wanted to point out is um, we have her drawing from 1956, and believe it or not, five years later, that's where she goes in a very short period of time. But if you look very carefully, here we have horizontal band, horizontal band, horizontal band, vertical, vertical. So we can see this interest in structuring her canvas around big chunks of horizontal and verticals. And here we see another tonal drawing um, on the right by Riley, a figure in a room. It's black and white, but to Riley, this drawing very much related to color because she was interested in the grays that could be produced in between the black and whites by smudging with her finger with an instrument, by applying less media, or by, again, using the white of the page. And at this point, it was a moment where she started to begin the work of the Norwegian symbolist artist Edvard Munch, and we see an example of his painting on the right called Puberty. Um, and one of the things that interested her, as she said, is, quote, how Munch's color developed from a tonal background. So what she sees potentially in this painting by Monk is not necessarily the colors in it, but the blacks and the lights, the shadows and the darks and the lights, which we see to some extent um, echoed in her drawing on the right. And this particular painting is called Mother. It's a painting she did of her mother in uh, the early 1950s. And she included it in the exhibition because she and I had been talking so much about Edvard Monk. And she goes, that's the one that really, where I was really thinking of Edvard Monk. So she nicely included it in the exhibition. As we're um, gonna be speaking a little bit about, um, Bridget Riley was profoundly influenced by the post-impressionist artist George Seurat. And it is fitting that her drawing retrospective is opening here at the Art Institute, home to um, George Seurat's iconic Grand Jatte painting, which we see at upper right, and very much a wish of hers to have her work very much connected um, with his. Um, and she actually kept a postcard, a photographic reproduction of the Grand Jatte on her studio wall all through her youth. So again, it was a very, very important work for her and his work in, in, in particular. And in light of Riley's drawings, I'm showing you another work by Georges Seurat on the lower right, which the Art Institute acquired just a few years ago. It's called The Zone. And Seurat very much used Conti Crayon, not just Conti Crayon, but sort of textured papers that um, gave a certain effect to the work. Um, and I think you can see the connection here um, between the two artists. And here's a bit what um, Riley Hurst said self about Seurat's Conti crayon drawings. She said, superficially, Seurat's drawings can be explained to some extent by what is depicted, by the choice of solitary figures, empty landscapes, desolate buildings, low light, or darkness itself. But the heart of this mystery, it seems to me, lies more in the powers of perception. To put it another way, by confronting us with an experience just beyond our visual grasp, Surat asks us, what is it that we are looking at? So again, we see this, this lone figure um, at the lower right in some kind of landscape. There's some belching factories behind her. There's that, that black area to the right is probably the Seine with a boat on the water. But again, it's um, we all bring something different to the work because it, there's, it's not completely exact. There's something rather mysterious and ethereal about it. Um, and it's something that she very much wants viewers to ask of her work. What is it that we are looking at? Again, Riley spoke very enthusi enthusiastically about Surratt's ability to create space out of black, white, and mid-tone. Um, and she's especially enamored with this one drawing called Man Dining. Um, and here we see these very uh, loopy lines, the very white of the napkin, the white of the lower part, the light on the head, but then these sort of loopy lines all throughout. The drawings, um, unlike Surratt's later paintings, um, very much inspired the artist to Bridget Riley to make copies after Surratt. She copied his paintings. Um, 
But in her work, for example, the woman on the left, we don't see the same kind of squiggly lines that we saw in Surat. But again, the, the media and the sort of feeling of it are, are very much inspired. Again, the sort of moody, uh, mysterious quality. Another thing that Surat, uh, Surat, Riley started to do is she was started making sort of exact, not exact, exact copies, but making copies after his paintings. And she did this as a way to learn. So what we have here is Georges Seurat's uh, bridge at Courbevoie, and it's at the Courtauld Gallery in London. Of course, it was important for her to have access to the original, being an artist that lived in London. Of course, it was this. Another painting bather at Asnier, she, was al she also liked. So this is the copy she made on the right. And then if you look on the upper um, right, those, those are details. And I think you can see Sura had these tiny little dots. That is how the term pointillism came about, literally dots of color, points of color. Whereas Riley's are a little bit broader, a little bit thicker, a little bit more of a, um, of a solid mark than his. But again, she was copying these works and it was very, um, a very important part of her process as we're going to see. So this transition from line to this kanji crayon tone into color is particularly clear in the preparatory drawings she made for her pointillus oil on canvas blue landscape, which you see right in, as you walk into the exhibition. And that is from 1959. So it was made the same year as her copy after Bridget Courbevoie, which we just looked at. So the graphite drawing on the left, which you can obviously see better in the exhibition, sort of frames the armature. Like this is vaguely what I'm gonna do. This is just the skeleton of the composition. And the tonal study um, in the middle, she works out again the light and shade, but then she has these um, very interesting marks, the, the dark black tree on the left and then this funny little curving tree in the middle, um, which sort of brings you, shows you the front of the picture plane going into the back of the picture plane. And then uh, she starts working out the color that she's gonna eventually use in the painting through very different strokes, sort of horizontal and vertical hatching in color. And then here we have um, the final painting. So she goes through all these um, various processes to figure out line, color, tone, and then she's ready to tackle the painting. Um, and again, this is in 1959. She, very few times has she let this painting out of her studio, so we're, we're really lucky to have it. Um, another artist besides Seurat that was very important to her was Piet Mondrian, the Dutch artist Mondrian. And you might think that what would have most impacted her were the gridded works, the color gridded works by Mondrian. The first, when I think of Bridget Riley, that's what I would think of. But in fact, she was much more interested in his early drawings, which we see here on the left, and we have a wonderful example in our permanent collection. Uh, the artist also did, she wrote an essay on Mondrian and she cu curated an, uh, an exhibition specifically of Mondrian's work in the UK. So she is very aware of his work. And what she said was, um, when she looked at Mondrian's trees, and we see an example here of one of his trees, she said, being essentially a subject that cannot be treated realistically, the tree offers a marvelous pretext for the fabrication of a rhythmic structure. So again, she, uh, here she's interested in the horizontal line which breaks up the trees to the tree's reflection, um, so there's the verticality of the trees, um, and less the sort of purely abstract works that that we see on the right. And I think there's a real connection here between Mondrian's tree and Bridget Riley's blossoming tree from 1858. She breaks down the visual cues really to their most elemental. The tree trunks are just armature for the sort of cotton candy um, tree clouds above them. Nothing is specifically delineated. The landscape is broken down into darks and the lights, and we see the cream of the paper is really uh, the, is the walkway that we see in between the two, and then the water below is just broad strokes um, of line. Riley also had a connection to the Swiss artist Paul Clay. And as she said, quote, Paul Clay was of seminal importance to me because he showed me what abstraction meant. So here we see her starting to move in a different direction. Uh, her attention to Clay coincided with the time she was transitioning from 
figuration into abstraction. Um, and again, Riley has also curated an exhibition on the work of Paul Clay, which he did in 2002. So if we consider this work on the left by Clay called Rock Cut Temple, we see it's really in the process of making the drawing that he creates it. He was very famous for saying, drawing is like taking a line for a walk. So you don't know where you're going, you just start, and as you move through, you create a drawing. Um, so here we see a variety of verticals and horizontals that make up this so-called rock cut uh, temple that Paul Clay creates. And then on the right, we see a work that she does, that Riley does called Encounter with Clay. It's not a copy of Clay, it's an encounter. So she's really just trying to interpret his work from her own. And here she uses a ballpoint pen, which is unusual for her, but I think it's important. We've all used ballpoint pen. They're very easy to run over the paper. There's not a lot of smudging. They're rather unforgiving. Once you make a mark, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so here she's using it in, and I think, a rather a playful way. And here she has um, squirrels, uh, swirls, zigzags, triangles, squares, all sorts of different shapes that she has to create this. And at this, point, at this point, she creates what is called her breakthrough moment when she moves purely into abstraction, this work on the left from 1960, untitled. But right before that, um, one of the things that she and I had talked about quite a bit is, is that really the breakthrough moment? Is the breakthrough moment pure abstraction or is it maybe something that happened a little bit before? And um, as she had said, she thinks her breakthrough moment possibly came a little bit early when she created this work called Recollections in Scotland. And it, her, her memory is amazing. This is done as 1959, and I was asking her about it, and she said, when I created this drawing, my sister and I were on the beach in Scotland, and I sat in the car as she was looking, and, um, and so she did everything from memory, and that's how she does a lot of, a lot of her work. She was just remembering back on, on her time in Scotland, and this is what she remembered of the shore and the rocks that were there. So she describes this as an equivalent to the visual perception of a rocky shoreline, not an exact representation of it. So again, I wanna remind you, this is one year difference. On the left, we have blue landscape, and the next year, we have untitled 1960, and she never goes back to representation again. And at first, they may seem impossibly different, these two works, but I hope I've shown you that um, it's really about dark and light and shape and color that she's interested in. Um, and so now we're going to move into pure abstraction. So this is one of the works in the exhibition that um, has never been shown before. It's called Study for Movement in Squares. And what we're going to see is a video of her describing it and how important it was to her. Um, but what we see here on, on the left is the study, the drawing that's in the exhibition, about this big, in the final painting, which is much bigger. Um, and what we see is the the width of the square is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we go left, and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it sort of creates this, this idea of like folding into the sheet of paper, folding into the canvas, and really plays with our eyes. So here's, here's the artist explaining it far better than I. A movement in squares, it was one small, change slowly, slowly, building on, building on, building on, building on until it accelerated into a rapid movement in the square. It, it, it so to speak, shuttled almost to extinction. And then it would have closed the painting. There wouldn't have been anything there. I could do nothing but come back. So I think it's interesting, what we're talking about is just exactly what we see on the sheet of paper, and it's, or in the painting in this example, um, and all the thought that went into it. Here's another example called Hidden Squares. Um, and the artist became very interested in sort of hidden or buried images that come out the longer you look at it. And here in this one, she began with a field of small circles in which she buried squares. 
And in these images, he's interested to show how the squares emerge out of the even repetition of the circles. Um, and the square was centered very much echoing the shape of the sheet of the paper, but she's very interested in, in what, what comes forward and what comes back um, as we continue to look. Oops. When we were uh, working on the publication, Riley wrote a short text on her use of the triangle um, and put some thoughts down on paper, something she'd never published before. And she said of the work on the left, I enjoyed working on the point movement for shift holding on to the two sides in relation to one another. And if we look very closely, we can see she's describing the different angles and the points of the triangle. So I'm gonna show you here, because it's a little bit hard to see. See, this, this point is going this way, this point is going a little bit in a different direction, and this point here. So she's really thinking just specifically of like, where the point of the triangle goes in relation to the other triangle, and she repeats it again and again and again. Um, on sheets of paper. And if we look closely, we can see um, another element in the drawing on the right, which is called preparatory drawing for shift. And she then says of this drawing, quote, both the top and the bottom were straight repetitions, but reversed, so the entire inner movements was determined by the two sides. So here she's talking about the movement that happens within the two dark squares in the negative space, the squares and the and the and the triangles. And again, it's one of those one of those works you really need to look at. Um, but then in oh, and of course I have to throw a plug in for our, our lovely book, um, which we decided to use um, this particular work um, available in the museum shop. Um, and I'm showing. I want to show you another angle, um, another example here of this preparatory drawing and then the final painting. And this is called Final Study for Burn on the left. Riley continues to explore the shape of the triangle, but in ways that make the work move internally, fade from dark to light and then go back again. The triangles are complicated by placing them here into a square format and individual triangles of black and white make up the image are subtly graduated. The blacks fade into this sort of silvery gray and then come back again. And I think it's interesting that here in the drawing, what is black and white is then completely reversed in the painting. So she's thinking um, always of, of these oppositions here. We're going to watch a clip um, from very early in her career where she's explaining the drawing burn on the left to an interviewer. And it's kind of interesting, A, how she describes the works, and then B, how incredibly polished she's become in describing her work. What I didn't show you is early on in the clip, she's talking and talking, and she goes, oh, God, that doesn't make any sense at all. And then she starts all over again. But one thing you can't really hear is the interviewer asks is a little bit of a different a uh, weird, I don't know, a little bit strange question, but he, what you can hear is when he says, so why do you do all this? And you'll see her wonderful answer. Let's have a listen. This, this triangle here is uh, logically a darker one than that, but, but visually this uh, will jump so much that these will pull right out and destroy that center point. So you have to suppress those. In fact, on the final painting, I suppress them more. Why uh, do you do all this? Um, Are you trying to show anything behind it? I just love the structure, you know, the, the argument of structure, and also the, 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 the um, em emotional uh, volume that it can present. This is why, in a sense, when I say, I mean, I start. This is, this is the thing that's important. It's where I begin, not, in fact, where I end. Once I have that, I know I'm standing on firm ground. So um, again, what's interesting to her is structure. That's the most important thing. And she begins, as she says, with a tiny element of the triangle, repeated again and again and again. 
In 1966, um, the artist started moving away from black and white and into gray. And she began to very slowly introduce color. And she saw gray literally and figuratively, figuratively as a connection, a bridge between her black and white work and color. But as you can see here, um, we have a gray sort of square, two different colors of gray, but then on top of them, we see slightly brown colors. So again, this is, I mean, this is color. Um, when we're, this is just the beginning, but you see these little brown and beige colors and then they kind of weave through the image. They're painted on top of it, but they almost look like there's holes, there are holes punctured into it. So following this exploration of grays, Riley begins to introduce very subtle elements of color. And in these works, we see a progression from pure grays to grays that introduce blue and red. So you'll see on, in many examples here, you'll see one side being very gray and then she introduces smaller and, and then larger and larger bits of color until we have a bright red on the far, on the far right. And here she began to pave the way for a new development or work that fully incorporated color. And this color really radically changed her work. And I want, I think this is a great image of the artist in the studio exactly at this moment, which is working on these gray, blue, and red images. Um, and one of the ones right behind her head is in our exhibition. So we're gonna look at another video clip um, where the artist describes the movement of the curving line. So what it is that the eye does when it looks at these curving um, horizontal and vertical lines. Bridget Riley's art is an exploration of the possibilities of vision. It is the result of continual trials and testing and experiment to find out what the eye can see, to experience what looking feels like. Rhythm and repetition are at the root of movement. They create a situation within which the most simple, basic forms start to become visually active. By massing them and repeating them, they become more fully present. Repetition acts as a sort of amplifier for visual events which, seen singly, would hardly be visible. But to make these basic forms release the full visual energy within them, they have to breathe, as it were, to open and close or to tighten up and then relax. A rhythm that's alive has to do with changing pace and feeling how the visual speed can expand and contract, sometimes go slower and sometimes go faster. The whole thing must live. I love the idea of the works actually breathing um, and sort of expanding and contracting. So um, at this point, the artist um, lets go the triangular, the circular, the square shapes, and she moves, devotes herself exclusively to the straight line, otherwise known as the stripe. And in these studio shots from the 1970s, we can see the color paper she uses. So what she does is she cuts up these tiny bits of paper and places them along, places them on a sheet, moves them around until she gets the colors that she wants and the order that she wants and the width that she wants. And then she makes a gouache drawing. So she makes a drawing of those vertical elements. Um, and that is the final work that she creates. And then, as I said before, gives to her studio assistants who then make the final painting. But um, I wanted to show you some details um, just to show you. So for example, on the left, we have uh, the halcyon, which is what the artist refers to as a crossover. And here what we see is the black line is a constant. The black line goes up and down. It doesn't move at all. But if you look in the exhibition, there's a sort of orange that is thick and then it disappears and then it reappears and crosses over to the other side. So these colors are sort of crossing over um, and that's part of the movement. And then the work on the right, these straight works up and down. Um, this is a, a detail here where you just see, um, see the colors. And sometimes there's blues next to blues, but it really vibrates um, 
as you look at it. And we have some, um, one example that I think is quite interesting. The artist went to Egypt in 1979 and became very inspired by the colors she saw there and brought them back into her work. And this is one such um, example. So what we have here on the left is um, all the gouache lines that I, the drawing that I mentioned that are um, painted onto a gridded sheet of paper. But then she says, no, this isn't quite right. So she takes cut pieces of paper or, you know, painted pieces of cut paper and she puts, you can see here this green mark here. And then here she puts this, this pink mark here. And again, these tiny, tiny little shifts um, make a big difference for her. And that's how she um, makes these changes in her, in her stripe paintings. So um, again, the straight line ranges from um, the crossover to the vertical, and then she moves away to some extent from this very vertical structure, although we still have, and these what she calls her rhomboids or zigs. So we still have the vertical structure here. You see the vertical lines, but there are these um, sideways lines. Um, that move in different directions. This is from the 1990s. And I think sometimes a picture tells a thousand words, um, says, and here we see here on the left, moving these little bits of paper um, along, uh, along um, a table to see what she wants to do with them, what she wants to try next. And it's hard to explain until you get up close to one of them. So I snapped a couple of pictures here and we see this is the work on the left the full drawing, and then as you see, hopefully you can barely see this, see there's this blue mark that's actually covering up a green underneath. So she takes this little piece of paper and covers it up, and then here at the top right here, she takes a, a white piece of paper and covers that up. So again, she's using collage and making ever so slight adjustments um, in her composition as she goes along. And of course, I just had to show a picture of her and the queen with these kinds of work. You can imagine this is the opening of the Tate um, several years ago, but I wanted to show this kind of work in, in that context. Um, and then she starts moving on to a little bit more movemented works. And one of the things I wanted to show you here on the bottom, these are all, you'll see this in the exhibition, these are all cut up pieces of paper moved, um, you know, created and put in specific areas on the sheet of paper. And then what she does at the top is she takes a piece of very thin tracing paper, puts it over it, something like we see on the bottom, and then she makes all these annotations. You can see all the annotations here. Um, and at the top, she says, she, she, that's one great thing about these drawings, you can see all her annotations, lots of math in there, lots of, you know, do this, do that with a color. And then she says, um, you know, basically, make all these changes, but keep everything else as is. In other words, I've changed everything, but besides that, just keep it as is. <laughs> it just kind of boggles the mind the amount of time that, um, and precision that goes into these works. Um, now, one of the last works she's experimenting, um, a different kind of experimentation, is she brings in a sort of curvilinear shape in a work called Lagoon, which we see on the left in her rhomboid paintings. Um, and a curve is, as a segment is incorporated again into the sort of usual vertical register that, of her stripes in the diagonal fields. And the title Lagoon can be very much connected to the round lagoon shaped cutouts in Henri Matisse's Jazz, which we see on the right from 1947. Those of you familiar with Matisse's work know that he very much also used cutout uh, shapes of color. Um, so to just sum up, I wanted to um, finish with the artist's words herself. This you can see, this is a Zoom interview during COVID with my apartment behind me. I'm surprised my cat didn't show up in this one. Um, but we did a Zoom interview with um, Bridget and her colleague James. We had a wonderful time. I learned a lot. And this is what Bridget said about the experience of looking at her drawings and how excited she was for you the, uh, the public to look at a whole body of work of her career. She said, to me, it's always been a great delight that people do look. Through this exhibition and showing these seeds of my art, including the early drawings, I hope to answer that question, the what and the basis and so on, without borrowing from science or descending into explanation, which ruins it. All of this has been 
as it is to every artist, a process of discovery. And that's what's really lived by the viewer. It's the way to make the past of it more open so that they can follow me and not found my art just bewildering and odd, unquote. So I would be um, more than happy to answer qu any questions you, you might have, um, but that is all. Thank you for coming. If someone might be able to turn the lights up so I can see hands if there are any. Who's the brave one? Yes, the brave first question. Oh, yes, and there's a, a microphone here in case you want to get up and speak into it. Yes. It's a really basic question, but I just didn't want to forget. Can you give us the view dates and the gallery numbers? Oh, the, um, the exhibition is open from today until, does anyone want to help me, January 13? I think it's January 13. Um, and then what you do is you go through the glass doors here, and you go, and the exhibition is just on your left. Any other brave souls want to ask a question? Yes. The question we're talking about our interest in um, painting yes. and doing. My question is, did she ever uh, delve into neuroscience? Into what? Uh, neuroscience, what happens if somebody looks at something? That is a very good, that is a very, yeah. Something? That's a very good question. She, um, she did know about neuroscience, um, and she also knew about um, psychotherapy and what certain visual things did to, did to the mood and to the brain. She, doesn't, she talks more about um, Proust than she does. She talks more about literature and music than she does about study of neuroscience, but it was so important in the op art movement. I'm sure she would have known about it, but it's not something she writes about very much. Other people write about it in relation to her work, certainly. And there was a period in her career in the 1960s where people said, oh, I feel sick when I look at it. It makes, you know, it makes me dizzy. Even one of my colleagues is like, oh, God, not before lunch. Um, <laughs> you know, it just it has different effects on different people. It doesn't have that effect on me at all. So thank you for that question. Come on. Oh, yes. Please. Yes. Um, I can't see that part. Okay. I have a question that sort of builds on that. Okay. I noticed that the exhibit, first of all, the exhibit's fabulous. It's Thank a great film study for the And I'm going to buy the book. <laughs> uh, there'll be a bill later for the viewing advertising value. <laughs> but tell me more about the contrast. In other words, I saw when she went into color, suddenly the contrast had us. And yeah. It, you, it occurred to me that there was a difference between this optical phenomenon that happens in your eyes versus what becomes a pattern. Did she, did she go on about how she walked away from contrast when she went away from black and white? From what, um, from, what she, from what the artist herself writes about that, it's really just a different kind of contrast. It's not, a, it's not an either or. The black and the white contrast to her is equally as interesting as the light pink to the semi-light pink to the dark pink. It's all just about contrast and what happens visually when one looks at that particular sheet of paper. So while I see, like for example, I mentioned when I saw that the copy she makes of the Surah, I see that and her black and white work. And the first I was like, how in the world did she go from that to that in one year? But they're both studies in contrast. They're both studies in dark and light and in shape. They just look completely different. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. He's one of our devoted study room visitors. He comes in and draws all the time. <laughs> I can't see anything, so. Anyone else? I will be in the exhibition um, in a few minutes, so if anyone has any questions in the exhibition, please feel free to ask me. Thanks so much for coming.